So I'm Donna James and I'm a functionally trained nutritionist and cognitive behavioral therapist. I have a practice principally in New York. I've been in practice for over 12 years. I specialize in women principally on weight management, mostly on the weight loss side of things, which includes looking at the gut microbiome, thyroid issues, adrenal issues, like digestive health, as well as mental health. That's my core demographic. So I started studying nutrition when I was 26, 27. And prior to that, I was in finance and I knew I wanted to do something di different. I just didn't fully know what it was. I was in interested in how food could influence the skin. I was dealing with my own skin issues. And so that was a key driver behind me wanting to study nutrition. At the time, Dr. Perricone had just come out with his first book on food and inflammation and, and, and which was focused on the skin. So I went into it from that perspective. Once I got into it, I realized it was really boring. Like to change the skin was eat more of a plant heavy diet. And, and I'm like, that's boring. And so I became much more intrigued by the mental health aspect, possibly because that was the spin of where I studied. But I will also say I wanted to understand the food and the weight perspective. I had in my mind and certainly in my body struggled with carrying more weight than I wanted to. And I was utterly confused. Like this is before blogs. And so now there's even more noise out there about what we should and we shouldn't be eating. And I, I realized that I knew everybody's cell job about diets, but I knew nothing about the physical body. And so when I got into studying nutrition, I was like, holy hell, like really, I don't have this knowledge. And so I became very fascinated with the biochemistry of the body. And so I would say like most of us, when we have our own personal experience with something, that's what we, we want to go into. So I didn't come from a background where I, was, I had an autoimmune disease or I was sick or anything like that. Mine was just much more of the typical things that happen to a woman, you know, a, a well woman who is feels like the quality of her life is is slightly lower because she's fixated on something or she's disappointed with the way that she looks physically. So I sort of fall into that category. And then I got into the mind piece. I was just, you have to go there. You have to go into the mind to understand these behaviors. Um, otherwise, you don't get there because you just those behaviors are ultimately what become self-sabotaging in terms of a diet. And, and so I went there and it was also part for me. Um, my book is about self-worth and I had no idea that I was struggling with some of that myself. And that's what often happens is we write about the things where there's, there's an interest. I trained originally in the UK as a nutritional therapist. So it's a four year program which incorporates nutrition, functional medicine in psychology. So that was my original training that is not offered here in the US. It should be, but it's not. Um, so I always came from that background and it was the institute was started by a, a psychologist. So there was a heavy influence of CBT and NLP and, and other psychologists psychological tools that you can use. I then added to that. So I found that that in itself was insufficient for the limitations I was coming up with in terms of nutrition and functional medicine. So then at a later stage, I trained at the Beck Institute and uh, Aaron Beck uh, created CBT, that's his, his modality. And that became a really pivotal tool in how I work with women and understanding the behavioral aspect of how they are with food and in relationships and their relationships themselves. So CBT means cognitive behavioral therapy and it's really classified as the gold standard for working with anxiety, depression and mental health issues. But what it truly is, is getting to the core belief behind your behaviors. So let's say that what I see typically is some a woman is out with a group of other women and it's family style eating and she's on this clean eating program or detox or whatever she's chosen to go on and for her she feels uncomfortable around asking for what she's wanting. Let's say that she's off gluten and dairy and maybe on like four glasses of alcohol a week. Then the alcohol comes around and she's on her third glass and before you know it, she's eating the bread basket and, and, and having some pasta. So it's like, well, why did that happen? Like getting to the core piece of that, that my clients will often say, well, the pasta tastes good. And it's like, that's great. It does taste good, but there's something behind that. And if you go all the way back to that, to, to the belief behind that, 
It's the fear that she's going to be ostracized and not included in the group because she's asking for something different. It's the fear that she's going to be perceived as a diva and not included in the group. So this type of woman I would call the nurturer archetype. And part of the, the belief there is she needs to be kind to everybody. She doesn't want to impose upon anybody. She gets into this people pleasing mentality. And, and so CBT pulls that out. And CBT will go back to what we call core memories. And these are core childhood memories. So something in her life created this belief that she needed to be this type of woman. She needed to make sure that everybody was happy, not impose herself upon somebody. There's some experience there and that's the filter that she views life through. So CBT gets to the core of that. Now, how does that relate to nutrition? Well, that was a very classic example of the food behaviors. So she knows what it is that she needs to do from an eating perspective, but can't follow through on it because of this erroneous belief, because it's an erroneous belief. And, and it pairs really well with functional medicine. So functional medicine is getting to the core root of the physical imbalance in the body. So let's say that there's anxiety. The anxiety is both psychological and there's a biochemical piece to that. Sometimes it's the biochemical piece that comes out first. Most often it's a psychological piece. So you want to be looking at both of those. Anxiety it may just be that she's low in magnesium because she is stressed. And magnesium is a natural calming agent to the, to the adrenaline and noradrenaline that supercharges under, under stress. And then there's a psychological piece here of what's causing that, that anxiety. In the case that we just explained, it would be this overriding fear that she's not going to be included in, in the group right? and all the other sort of behavioral manifestations that come from that. So they're both about getting to the core root of what it is about functional medicine is the biochemical piece and CBT is a psychological piece. If you're bloated, what's going on with the bloating? Why are you bloated? It's uncovering that and that's what you do with functional medicine. I might suggest to a client that they have a gut microbiome test so that we can see what's the status of the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, are there parasites, their, their yeast, how well are they digesting their food and so forth so we understand what's causing that bloating. It may be that they are stressed and they're not digesting their food and so that's, what, that's what's contributing to the bloating there or it could be that they've picked up a parasite and so every time they're eating food food, the parasite is fermenting that food and causing this distension. So it's, it's not, or it could be that they're constipated. Right? You've got to find out which route it is to actually resolve it. So that's like correcting the biochemical imbalance in the body or the cellular imbalance or whatever word you want to use. And then the psychological imbalance is like the example that we just used. It's like, what's the where uh, where's the anxiety being caused from? Like, what belief do you have behind that that's contributing to that? Uh, and it will always go back to childhood. There, there are these beliefs that were created typically between the ages of six and nine, sometimes between the ages of six and 12, and, and they're off. They are incomplete. They are, are perceived through the mind of a child, which is really wonderful, but it's very emotional. It's not done through the lens of rational thinking because uh, the prefrontal cortex as part of the brain here is not fully developed until the age of 21. So there's going to be an emotional response to something. When we feel that type of pain, we start to put in protective mechanisms in place. We, we go, oh, I don't want to feel that pain ever again. So we take on this belief and then put these coping strategies in place. So it's getting a, a greater understanding of what happened during childhood and most likely reinterpreting that, that experience and that belief because it's just, it's very siloed. So that was back in 2006. And so there was not a lot of research at all on the gut brain connection. That's very recent research. But what I witnessed was how powerful food was in changing somebody's mental state. And one of my uh, very first clients was a social worker and she was, utterly depressed, could not work. And when I looked at her diet, she had, unbeknown to her, had been eating a vegan diet, but not a plant-based vegan diet. It was starting with a piece of toast in the morning with marmalade on it. And then for lunch, it was brown rice and some vegetables. And then probably like, like a pasta dish. So 
way too heavy in those carbohydrates. There's very little amino acids coming in because there's no protein coming in from the diet. There's no animal protein. There's not really even strong plant-based proteins coming in. And, and you need those amino, amino acids to create your neurotransmitters, whether you're working with like GABA or dopamine or serotonin, some of those very, very, uh, very well-known neurotransmitters. And so all I did then was switch the diet. She came back within two to four weeks and was a completely different person and, we, and was ready to go back to work. And so that was such a powerful experience to see that these simple shifts in the diet could produce a profound effect within the brain and the mind. But now we know so much more than that. And if I was to, to go back to, to that time, I would have had her on certain supplements. I would have been investigating more things. But in this case, she didn't need it. It was purely from a dietary perspective. Going back to the gut-brain connection, and it's also brain-gut connection, is that the gut microbiome, which composes of bacteria, yeast, and parasites, it works in a whole host of ways. So from, from working with the thyroid, from the absorption of minerals, from the creation of vitamins, to working with the thyroid hormone, and, and so forth, many, many different functions within, within the body as well as your obvious digestive health. But when it's out of balance, which means that there's more bad or pathogenically pathogenic bacteria or parasites or yeast and it skews in the in the wrong way, it becomes inflammatory. So the there are inflammatory cytokines that are produced, there are little toxins that are produced, and these can move outside of the large colon into other areas in the body, and there's a communication between the gut and the brain. And so the inflammatory cells will speak to the inflammatory mechanisms within the brain and that can cause a distortion in mental health. So it's a very biochemically based reason for depre depression in particular. And uh, however, the same thing goes the other way is that under stress and anxiety, you will also change the gut microbiome. So that's harder research. Because there's, if somebody's stressed, there's so many other facets that go into that. You can't just say that person's stressed and therefore the gut microbiome has changed. But there are, there's certainly research pointing in that, in that direction. An interesting one is they took students, they looked at their gut microbiome at the beginning of the semester and then they looked at it during exam time. Completely different gut microbiome. So that could just be from the, the stress of the exams and the anxiety over the semester. It could also be that the diet has changed. There's not enough sleep, there's more alcohol, so there's a whole host of things that could also be going on on there. That's why the, this side from the brain to the gut is, a, is harder to, to prove. But I will tell you in my practice, there's no question that the mental state influences the gut microbiome. And when I run stool tests to look at the gut microbiome, when somebody's gone through a trauma, for them a lot, perhaps a parent has died or um, they've broken up going through a divorce or a separation, the good bacteria is so depleted, it looks like that they have taken antibiotic upon antibiotic. And to me that's enough evidence to say it's bi-directional. One is not um, a precursor to the other, they move in both directions. The intangible is interesting because we don't give a lot of credence to it. We can't see it and therefore we dismiss it. It is a new way of thinking. I would say if this work sounds interesting to somebody watching this video or listening to it on the podcast is to actually pick out my book which is called The Archetype Diet because that gives you both aspects of it. So I'll use an example of, of food. You can have the same meal prepared in the home with a lot of love. Let's say it's your, your partner has made this amazing um, chicken dish with, you know, Italian chicken dish with tomatoes and onions and zucchini and a gorgeous arugula salad and it's made with a ton of love. So when you eat that, you are gonna feel that vibration. You are gonna feel that love coming into the food. There's something about it that feels really nourishing. You take that same meal and it's picked up from outside and it's mass produced um, it's probably been sitting there for maybe an hour or two and somebody's not thinking about it. They're just thinking about, I gotta get this out, I gotta do this, what's my next task? The ingredients are identical, but the feeling behind it is very different. And so you are not gonna take on that same sense of nourishment and love that you would when somebody prepared it for you. So that's the intangible piece to it. 
And there's another piece that's very energetic, which is thinking about some of the chakras, which comes from Ayurvedic medicine and, and the color spectrum. And I go into great detail in my, in my book on this about other ways for us to look at fruits and vegetables. We're very fixated on the chemical piece. What are the phytonutrients in a tomato? <laughs> okay. So in that there, we know that there's lycopene in it. We know that the lycopene is very supportive for the skin. It stops the, it decreases the burn rate in the skin. It also helps to support the bone structure. A wonderful research on that type of strengthening within the, within the physical. The red has a vibrational piece to it. So if we think about physics and the frequency of colors, we know there's a frequency to it. We can't see it, but, but that's, it has the ability to be measured. When well, you take that frequency and apply it with the Ayurvedic medicine and the sh chakras, there's an emotional piece to that. So the red is associated with the first chakra and that's about security and stability. And so when that's off, we tend to feel more uncertain of our place in the world. And so the red there is working on strengthening that emotional aspect of, of stability and of protection. Well, what's the chemical piece? It's protection, protection from the sun, it's protection and strengthening the bone structure. So there's just this nice overlay with it. I also find it's much easier to talk about the intangible aspect of that with women. Men love the chemical piece. Women remember the, the physical. It's like red is about helping me with my strength and my security and my place in the world. Remember that it's more exciting. I think same with green. So green's here with the heart chakra. So if you want to feel more love in your life, if you want to open up to more love in, a, in your life, because often like with particularly my Wonder Woman archetype, like she shut it down. Right? So you start to add more greens, add, add drink the green juices, okay? eat the kale salad and the spinach salad and consciously be aware of that and how that can have that expansion there. And then you can get onto the chemical side of all the wonderful things with the greens, which we, which we already know about. So I created these four female archetypes to help women really understand themselves because it's a complex topic of the physical body and the our emotional uh, side of things. And so with these archetypes, you find your archetype by understanding where you source your self-worth from. That's the key behind it all. And there are four ways that we source our self-worth from. One is from success and achievement which I would call the Wonder Woman. Then there's from being there for others, caring for people, which is the nurturer. Then there's the self-worth is based on physical appearance, which is called the femme fatale. And then there's the self-worth is based on being different and really creative and imaginative, and that's called the ethereal. And so each of these sources of self-worth have a certain set of behaviors that stem from that. Those behaviors also include food behaviors, which then change the hormones, which then changes the shape of the physical body. So there's a dietary element to that of the way each archetype can eat to rebalance their body. And then you look at the mind piece behind it to understand why these imbalances are created. So we'll take the Wonder Woman. So when the sense of self-worth is based on success and achievement, what are the behaviors around that? It's you're striving to be the best. So you're very ambitious, you're driven, and you're determined because that's your sense of self-worth. That's where you come from. So the, for a Wonder Woman, the thought of being irrelevant is so painful for her. So she's going to be working, and she's the one that's still going to be checking her emails at 10 p.m. at night because she doesn't want anybody to think that she could be dismissed um, because that for her is like death. Right? If, if she's not perceived to be intelligent or important, it truly is, is, is deadly for her. And, and, and she feels this is uh, really anxious. So with that belief, what I also see is that she's a reward eater. So she is the type of person so busy that she often can forget to eat. And she might be the person's got very small space allocated to having lunch. If a meeting runs over, well then her lunch break is gone. Right, that she's gone and she's before she knows it at 3 p.m. The only thing that she's put into her mouth is a handful of M&Ms on the way to a co-worker's desk. And then by the time she gets home, she's super hungry and is ready to put anything into her mouth. Or she's the reward eater. I need the glass of wine. I've had a hard, stressful day at work. Don't take my wine away. That's that's how I'm going to switch off. Or I need the I need the chocolate every day. So, so to try and take the glass of wine or the chocolate out of the Wonder Woman's diet is really challenging for her unless she understands the why. 
because behind all of that, it's this, I need to be the best. And she actually doesn't. Hey, that's, the, that's the erroneous belief. There was something that happened in childhood that said to her, you are valued because of your success. Something very, very uh, specific to her. Out there with society, what do we value? We value success and looks, principally. That's where it is. But we don't all like that. So that particular woman had something very, very uh, particular to her that caused that belief, and hence she went in that direction. So when you have that belief, what hormone is dominant? It's cortisol. Cortisol is the body's stress hormone that enables you to cope and not break down. When cortisol is elevated, and you tend to store body fat around this area. So if, first and foremost, that's where you store it, and then you start to store it everywhere. So if you want to get rid of the body fat from this area, which is most often the Wonder Woman's complaint, is that you need to eat in a way that doesn't exacerbate the cortisol, you also need these mind changes. So this is where meditation and play and connection becomes so much more important for her. But she's so busy in this, I need to be the best, I need to be the best, that play becomes irrelevant. Right? And it's, I've got to do my work before I connect. And that is not accurate. Right? To be balanced is you want all of that. You don't actually need to be the best. It's actually be the best at managing it all. So be the best at, at being successful while at the same time, like being able to connect with people, like feeling like a woman, having an amazing relationship with your partner and your children. You can't be the best at all of those. It's impossible. You don't have the capacity or the energy to do that, but that's what the Wonder Woman believes. I'm a Wonder Woman, I understand it. <laughs> I mean, instead, it's like, pull that down. Right? Be the best at managing all of that, because that's where the joy comes from, is being able to be balanced in all those areas. I often say to a woman, I say, what type of man do you want to be married to? Do you want to be married to the man that's like super successful at work and that's it? He doesn't have time for you, he doesn't have time for his kids, and he's got this belly here because he's drinking? Well, guess what? You're the feminine version of that. Flip it. Right? When we put it in that perspective, we get it. We're like, holy hell, no, I don't want to be that. But that's the direction that she's going in. Right? We actually want to be with a man who's successful enough. Successful enough and he can be home with you to connect with you on a very intimate level. Like he's got a good libido. <laughs> he wants to take you to in, the, in the bedroom. He can connect with his kids. Right? He's got time to, to eat in a way that's healthy. He's got time to, to go to the gym. He's got time to play. That's what we want. And so it's the same with us. So that's the Wonder Woman. I spent more time on her because I wanted her to be the base. Um, and when I talk to groups, it's pretty much split between the Wonder Woman and the Nurturers. They're almost equal. And then I have handfuls of ethereals and, and fevertales. So with the Nurturer, it's this belief that she, she is validated and worthy when she cares for people. And what's happened there in childhood is, is there's often an, somebody's sick in the family, Maybe there was some type of alcoholism or drug abuse, um, divorce, um, or maybe a sibling required more attention. Um, maybe this, the sibling had um, autism and it, the, the parent's focus was on the sibling. But there's some type of emotional neglect that happens. And so the child and the nurturer child believes that if she takes care of things, she takes care of things around the house and is the peacemaker and makes sure that everything's fine. She can often be the buffer between, say, a mother and an alcoholic father or, or the buffer with the siblings and a mother who's irascible. And so she takes on that, that type of role really common for the nurturer. Sometimes the nurturer is comes out of a product of having a very nurturing mother and so she's a very balanced nurturer so if you have that belief that you are worthy because you're the peacemaker or or you make everything smooth what are your behaviors you're the people pleaser right everybody before you right? everybody comes before you and I use the example of sitting at the at the family style dinner table and not being able to assert yourself to say hey, can I get some vegetables because to put yourself first is so foreign because it didn't happen as a child. If you did that, would, nothing would have gotten done. And it's just it's very, really sad for the nurturers. Not all the nurturers, but that's, those are very, very common background. And so with the nurturers, there's no nurturing coming their way. They don't also allow it because they feel like it's their responsibility. So, so they're, like, they're left here, like giving, 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 giving. Can they get depleted? Their they're, adrenals attacks, they get really severe thyroid issues if they allow this to go on without checking. They'll tend to be a comfort eater. And you're a comfort eater because there's no nourishment and nurturing coming your way. So my 
out of balance nurturer here knows that she should have the protein based smoothie for breakfast, but the morning's chaos. Cat, the kids are running around, like her head's in a chaos, and she's out the door and she grabs a gluten free muffin on the, on the way to work. So, those carbohydrates then stimulate insulin. Insulin's the body's fat storage hormone. And so then she stores body fat everywhere because that's what insulin does. It's not on the stomach like we see with the Wonder Woman. Over time, if this goes on and on, the elevated levels of insulin start to interfere with estrogen. Then she starts to store body fat here. And so she feels like very voluptuous and hippie. Then you get a whole host of other issues. She often has PCOS, She's insulin resistant, and then there's issues with testosterone. Um, she is most susceptible to the autoimmune diseases, which there's a strong correlation between a traumatic childhood and autoimmune diseases called the ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and there's a lot of research on that. So if somebody's interested in it, they can do that. I do talk about this in my book. Um, and, and so with the nurturer, then, then you need to break this belief that you are worthy because you care for people. It's a very wonderful way to be, but she's not worthy because she cares for people. She's simply worthy because of who she is because it's her, just her presence. She doesn't need to be there and people pleasing the entire time. It's a hard thing to break. In the book, I explain how to do that for all of the archetypes. Then there's a particular diet plan that goes with that as to how to rebalance those estrogen levels, as to how to rebalance those, those, uh, the, the insulin levels for her. So it's different to the Wonder Woman, because the Wonder Woman's about cortisol. The nurture is about insulin and estrogen. So you start to see they're very siloed, so that you can go, oh, that's me. Right? That's the plan that I need to follow here, as opposed to, oh my God, is my cortisol out of balance? Right? Maybe I need to follow the autoimmune disease, and no, you don't. Right? You know, I need to follow the autoimmune um, protocol for my way of eating because it's the strictest, right? That will make me the healthiest, which is not correct. Right? I want women to be able to eat the most amount of food possible while still achieving their goals. And that's really what, that's the, another thing behind the book. And then we have the femme fatale. And so the femme fatale is the self-worth is based on looks. So when you believe you're worthy because of what you look like, that's a hard place to be. Right? You're often on and off a diet constantly because you believe if you have a leaner, hotter, sexier body that you're worthier. And that's part of society. That's what, we, that's what we're told. Right? But not all of us swallow that. Right? We can often be what I would call an overlay, a second tier piece. And, and we are aware of it, particularly for the Wonder Woman, because the Wonder Woman likes to be perfect. She likes to be everything, so that can be coming in. But her work for the Wonder Woman will still take over the, the body piece. For the femme fatale, it doesn't. Life is all about this. When she's balanced, she's so exquisite to be around. She's sparkly and sexy and fun and playful, but she's not often like that because she's too fixated on the body here. So for her, it's more of a shift in mindset, understanding why that happened. I've never met a femme fatale where she was created because her parents gave her lots of accolades on how she looked. It's always in the wound. It didn't feel pretty enough. Sister was pretty, her best friend was pretty, like something like that. There was always that. And so she feels like she needs to catch up. One of my femme fatale clients uh, was 14 and she went to the optometrist. She's very pretty, but she has some asymmetry in her eyes. And, and the optometrist said to her, oh, don't worry, you just won't be a model. Tragic, tragic for a, like a very pretty 14 year old. And so from that, she was like, oh my goodness, I'm ugly and I need to have a hot body. I, I've got like a butter face, which means that, you know, ugly face and got to have a good body. And so she has been in and out of restrictive eating to binge eating because of this very simple throwaway comment. Um, we're still working through this together on this because it's so imprinted. And sometimes they don't want to look at it, so you don't really want to look at that because there's also an attention piece that can come from it. And, and funny, I sent her to the facialist and the uh, facialist was like, oh my goodness, she's like a fitness model. She's so beautiful. And I was like, yes, yeah, she is. I said, did you say that to her? And I, she said, I did. And I was like, fantastic, because somebody told her at 14 that she couldn't be a model. And, and I asked her, is this her yesterday or yesterday? And I said, I said, how did you feel about that? And she was like, at least somebody thinks I could be a model. And yes, right? It's really, it's really tragic. And sometimes we look at these femme fatales because they can be in what I would call the magnification or the withdrawal. The magnification is they're on Instagram and there's lots of selfies, right? It's a, it's, that is not a 
somebody that feels really good about themselves. It's trying to seek validation. And then there's in the withdrawal. There's no freaking way that they're putting a selfie on Instagram. You got both of them here, right? Because they're so scared that they're going to be judged. And so they pull back and then this femme fatale is, is on there. Like I will say, I can't tell a femme fatale when I look at her, but give me her social media account and I can tell you if she's a femme fatale. So, so and there's, her plan is very similar to the Wonder Woman plan. It's, it's more balanced. She often needs to eat more carbohydrates because she's been told to take them out. She's been told to take fruit out of the diet. She thinks that that's the way to lose the weight and it actually isn't. And so we put that back in uh, um, for her. Then there's the ethereal. And the ethereal is who we all want to be like from a dietary perspective um, because she gets to eat the most amount of carbohydrates. So with the ethereal, she tends to have this very willowy body. Um, weight is not an issue for her. She tends to be low in estrogen and that causes its own complications, which the other archetypes don't understand. So when you're low in estrogen, well, estrogen is like the accelerator for serotonin. So they will come in because they're sad. There, there's some, some depression that has nothing to do with what's going on in their life. It's very biochemical. Not enough estrogen for, and for the serotonin to work in tandem together. They can experience infertility. Their menstrual cycle is off. They will have gut microbiome issues, which all the archetypes are susceptible, but the, for the ethereal, the, she comes in because she's bloated and she's anxious and she's depressed. With my other clients, they're coming in for weight issues and then a whole host of other things. But this is very, like, that's what the ethereal comes in to see me for. And um, the ethereal is very creative and spiritual and airy. And I go like this when I describe it, because that's how she feels. There's a feeling to her. There's a softness to her. And, and when she is truly in the ethereal, ethereal stage, it's such a beautiful, wonderful experience. Most of the time she's not because society hasn't valued that intuitive aspect of within ourselves in, in women and, and certainly in men. And so she often takes on the mask of one of the other archetypes and she might become the Wonder Woman. She might become the femme fatale. And when she takes on that mask, she's even more out of balance than what a what a true Wonder Woman or a true femme fatale would be because it's so far into her. Like an ethereal, like a Wonder Woman who's very driven and determined. For the ethereal, her natural way of being is without that structure. So it feels really compressed for her. And when she feels compressed, everything starts to shut down. And, and when she moves into that femme fatale state, the, dis, the, the fixation on the physical body is so off for an ethereal who act naturally cares less about the physical body. So she is more here in the super consciousness in the intuitive space. And we need to really get the ethereal to, to own who she is, to know that she's the ethereal and get back into that. Right, to discard the, the, the values that society places on her to be this Wonder Woman, to be this femme fatale. And sometimes she's the, the nurturer as well. And instead it's like, be the ethereal. Like allow yourself to get created, be imaginative. Like, like move into that true way of being. For her, the diet is more carbohydrates. She needs these carbohydrates. She needs like the lentils and the chickpeas and the soba noodles and the sweet potato to ground her because otherwise she floats up here in this like very lost sort of type of space. But when you get the carbohydrates right, you can regulate the estrogen. So with the, with the nurturer, we have to pull out the carbohydrates to lower the insulin levels and to lower her estrogen levels. We do the opposite with the ethereal. We have to add more of those carbohydrates in so she can get more of the estrogen. So she works really well on a vegan diet because she can eat more of those, those sort of starchy carbohydrates with the protein there. Um, she can be having the macro bowls and the soba noodle bowls and the things that are that are sort of in vogue right now with, with eating. But she's really the only archetype that responds really well to that, like on a regular basis. So you, you see why this particular body type works well with this particular type of food. And you identify your body type and your way of thinking. There are outliers. Sometimes people are like, well, I'm the ethereal, but I'm in a nurturer body because they're often taking on the nurturer mindset. And so then I say, well, you then follow the nurturer diet until the body rebalances. And then you go to, to more of the ethereal way once you're more in that creative side of things. If you want to know what your archetype is, you can either pick up the book. Picking up the book is a good idea because it then shows you what your second one is. Mm -hmm. You can also do it online. 
And that's at my author website, which is Dana, like Dana, danajames.com. And it says find your archetype. And that will tell you very quickly, it will tell you within the 30 seconds or a minute what your dominant archetype is. Um, and you'll know, like when you get it, you're like, oh yeah, this is me. And then if you get it, you're like, this is not really me, then you do the quiz in the book because you might find, well, that one was just off. And, and you know, perhaps you're, you find that you're a Wonder Woman, but you're like, oh, I'm not really like it. Then maybe you find your friend Vitell, and then you're like, no, I don't really know how much of that is accurate. And then you do it in the book and you realize that they're, they're equal. And that means that for you, the psychology for both of those archetypes you'd want to work through. The diets that are out there are, they work. But it, it's the first question that you ask yourself is, what is your goal? And uh, um, like the autoimmune protocol is a protocol for autoimmune diseases. But what happens is that that women who like want to lose weight, which like still 95% of the population, like have some idea that that they need to be losing weight, they jump onto the the idea that they need to follow this because this is the strictest plan. So they end up over restricting um, for their particular body, and then that causes other other um, feelings of depletion and, and so forth. So it, it depends what it's about. Uh, right now, intermittent fasting is like all the rage. And it's now being correlated to expedited weight loss, which I'm just gonna say is not true. Like, when you eat an eight hour period versus a 12 hour period, if the caloric count is the same, it's about the same. Right? What happens with the intermittent fasting is you also end up with blood sugar imbalances, anxiety and panic attacks. And, and why would you wanna do that to yourself? Right? So it's, I ask women, I say, well, why do you wanna do the intermittent fasting? And when they say to me for weight loss, it's like, that's not the program for you at, at all. Right? If it, and the research on that is just isn't even there. The research is on uh, research is there for a potential anti-aging perspective because of the telomeres. What has been misinterpreted? That's a proxy, right? A proxy that is going to give you a longer sense of life. Well, what else does that? So does eating vegetables. Take your pick. Do you want to go on a eat within an eight-hour period, getting blood sugar imbalances? and surviving on coffee for the first four hours of the morning? Or do you want to just eat some more vegetables? Right? You get the same effect. So it's, it's, it's always like, well, what are you doing it for? And then you have to match it with that. Um, like the paleo, the paleo is great for certain people. Um, um, the concept behind it is wonderful. It just gets misinterpreted. So when you think paleo, it's like nuts and red meat. Right? That's a misinterpretation of the paleo. It's one way. The paleo can also be fish and vegetables. So for my nurture archetype, she would be on a paleo type of plan, but I would never describe it to her that, that way because I don't want her eating red meat and I don't want her eating too many nuts. So for her, it's like there's more, it's more plant-based. So three quarters of her plate is, is plants, is vegetables. And then she's got eight ounces, sorry, not eight ounces. She's got five, five ounces of some type of animal protein, more on fish and 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 poultry because it's lighter which is what she needs so it's still paleo here but it's not what she thinks paleo is so the the subtleties become really important now with that archetype she's often told to go on paleo and it's and she eats red meat and and um nut butters and and it's horrible for her right and just it just it's great from an insulin regulating perspective but that's it so she ends up eating more, more animal protein and the body gut starts to develop more muscle because she tends to be higher in testosterone and she gets, feels heavier. This is the opposite of what we're trying to do for her. So it's, it's, it's the, the, what I will say is there are subtleties in the diet that are really important. A cardiologist is probably gonna tell you don't eat red meat, follow a plant-based diet because he's looking at the negative effect of excess saturated fat from from the people over consuming shitty meats, right? Versus somebody from a mental health perspective will be like, you absolutely need your red meat coming in. If you follow a vegan diet, then you're gonna cause some distortion with the neurotransmitters. That's a great example of how you've got, got two very educated physicians, different demographic, different diet, because they should have a different diet. If you look at your plate, in general have 75% of that being plant-based and and that's vegetables as well as some like avocado or pine nuts or olives or something and you know maybe there's some sweet potato or potato but 75% the split bit is de is dependent on your archetype and your goals but 75% plant-based and then you've got some type of animal protein there that's my preference you could do the the vegan option but that's the way to look at it as like that's where I would start somebody with oh this is what my plate should look like and then you can get into um, 
refining it based on what your goals are and what your, I would use my archetype language, what your archetype is. The missing piece is connection. And uh, I can give you countless stories of women independent of their archetype where they're just not connected. They're too busy with certain things happening in life and that lack of connection will change the eating behaviors in a negative sense. The more intimacy that you have and the deeper the connection you have with somebody, you feel held. And so then you don't need to use food in a way as a proxy or a substitute for that. And there's more and more research coming out on the importance of being connected. And Stephen Cole is a researcher at UCLA and he's a genomics researcher and has studied the effect of loneliness in particular and has said that loneliness is a greater risk factor for um, chronic disease than smoking. You know, women will come in and talk to me about things and their diet could be really beautiful and they're exercising but they're, they're not living life, they're too protected and so they can't get into these, they can't be vulnerable because it can feel like a weakness for them and it's like pulling down those layers, like letting them go, it's not a weakness and start connecting here from a heart perspective. We know from the eating disorder world it's the same thing, you heal in this connection and this community.